We're talking about the stories of Jesus, and the one today is about the fig tree and repentance, about repentance. I might have told you about the two pastors. One was a Catholic priest, and the other was a Baptist minister, and they had churches side by side, and, and they were really concerned about the fact that things were not going well in the community, and so they decided to team up, and they both made their signs. They stood out on the road, and they were holding their signs to cars as they were going by, and, and the sign said, repent, the end is near. And cars would go by and they'd mock them and laugh at them. Oh, you old fogies, you old traditional religious people. Don't you know we're living in the modern era? Cars would go by and then they'd hear a little after they'd gone by, screeching of tires, a pause and then a crash. Car, another car would go by doing the same thing. This is happening. So finally a Catholic priest turned to the Baptist minister. You think we should change our sign to read Turn around, bridge out ahead. <laughs> Repentance is that whole idea that you turn around. You're going in one direction, you need to go another. In the, the story that we have here, I want to talk about the political scene behind what the story itself. There's politics going on in the ancient world just as they are in the modern world. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans who blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now obviously the Galileans went down to Judea and they were taking their sacrifices and they were in the, the temple court and they were taking their sacrifices and something drastically happened that Pilate is responsible and this rumor it comes back to Jesus while he's teaching the people. Now, now, now this is kind of a test for Jesus. Is Jesus going to get political? It's kind of a test for Jesus. If he says something negative about Pilate, will the Romans come and seize him before his time and go that he is set to go to the cross? If he doesn't say something about this, will this make Jesus look like he's siding with the Romans? So you see, it's kind of a political dance going on here. And they came to him and told him about how Pilate had mixed the sacrifices of the people with their blood. Now, Pilate was not a nice man. Okay. Uh, Josephus, first century historian, writes and tells us about five occasions where uh, he was rather brutal to the Jews. Uh, when he came to, to the region, he brought the insignia of the Roman emperor Caesar into Jerusalem and it caused such a stir that people were protesting because it was an image of a foreign god. And so he was willing to slaughter them and they were willing to die on their principle that we will not worship your false god Caesar. And so he backed down and he sent the insignia to Caesarea instead. On another occasion, there was, uh, he had misdirected or redirected uh, the money from the temple to build an aqueduct. You know, a way to bring in water, but it was never intended for those purposes. So the people rebelled, and in their rebellion, in a protest that they were having in, in the temple region, he dressed up his soldiers in civilian's clothes and mingled them in with the people and they then uncovered their weapons and began slaughtering the people indiscriminately of who they were. Could have been such an occasion as that. We're not sure about the details which occasion it was. It could have been an occasion like that where this whole idea that he mixed their sacrifices with their blood it was that he slaughtered them at the very place they had brought their animals to be slaughtered as a sacrifice. In any case... There's politics behind the scene here, and they're asking Jesus, okay? Uh, they're informing him. There's no question here. They're informing him, but Jesus knows that it's a question. What do you do about this, Jesus? It kind of reminds me of the tragedy that went on at First Baptist Church in the Sutherland Springs, Texas, just last November, where someone indiscriminately went in and just shot masses of people. That's what was going on back then. It happens now. And Jesus responds and says, Jesus answered their, their statements, their report. 
And Jesus responds, do you think that the Galileans were the worse, were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? Jesus does something really interesting here. He turns the question from Pilate to them in his presence. Do you think the Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? Two things happen when a disaster happens. One is, where was God? That's the question. The second one was, is, and, and still is to this day, it was especially back then, it was usually the first question, what, what did they do that they deserved this? And we still ask that question today. What did I ever do to deserve this? There is this idea that when something bad happens to me, it's because I did something wrong. Or the other part of that question is, why isn't God doing something? Right? And so it's got this question going on here. Jesus answers his own question. See, this is a rhetorical question. He didn't really expect them to give the answer. He gives the answer. He tells you, I tell you, no, they weren't the worst sinners. He's not saying they weren't sinners. They, he's just saying, no, they weren't the worst sinners. Because if you've read your Bible, you know all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And so they, they all deserve to die. The question isn't, why, why did they die? The question is, why should they live? Because the wages of sin is death. But he says, no, I tell you, they weren't the worst sinners. But then he changes the subject. He says, but unless you repent, unless you turn around, you're going in one direction, unless you turn around and you're going the other way, you're going on your own path, you're going down the world's path, you're going it on your own. He says, unless you turn around and you, you come to Jesus, he says, you too will, I like this next word, notice it, die. Oh no, it doesn't say die, does it? Perish. Perish. You see, he has taken an incident that happened right then, and he said, I wanna, I'm going a little deeper than the surface physical. I'm going to the spiritual. Most of us know John 3.16. If not, it's on our memory verses for the year. Okay, we will memorize that verse. And though, okay, I mean, everybody should have that verse memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. There's my word. Perish. Perish. But, in contrast, the, the opposite of perishing is to have eternal life. So the opposite of eternal life, perish, is to have eternal death. The Bible defines death as a separation. My body dies when my immaterial part separates from my body. I'm dead. I die. My body dies. A person is spiritually dead. Sec second death is when they are separated from God for all eternity. Eternal life is to be present with God for all eternity. <laughs> He's elevated this. So listen, as bad as the circumstances might be, what Pilate might have done. You need to search your own soul and see, have you turned from yourself to trust in God? Because if you don't, it's more than the bridge out ahead. It's perishing that is ahead. Perishing that is ahead. He said, I want to move it beyond that. Yeah, it was a terrible atrocity that an enemy did to us. All right. But he says, now, or those 18 uh, who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. I don't know if the tower was in construction or if it was just a bad repair, but obviously the tower had fallen and collapsed, and in the process, it had killed 18 people. He asked the same question. Do you think that they were guilty, more guilty, than others living in Jerusalem? I mean, we could ask the same question. Do you think that those poor people inside the towers, when they collapsed, were worse than everybody else in New York? Or we could ask ourselves, this last week, two high school girls were driving down I, I, I 96 
Their car went off the road. They hit a tree, two trees, and it killed both girls. And they were just high school girls. You can't blame that on Pilate. You can't blame that on the government. You can't blame that. It was an accident. He said, do you think that they, they were more guilty than others living? I tell you, no. But then he elevates it a second time. But unless you repent, you too will all, not just die, but you'll perish. You'll perish. This is the preface to the story. And in this preface to the story, he's told us two times that they were not guiltier than other people. You see, we're all guilty. The soul that sins shall surely die. The guy was one time asking the other gentleman about statistics, and he said, uh, what's the death rate around here? The guy said, one apiece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he added, yeah, and there's some who's dying that have never died before. <laughs> yeah. We're all guilty. All guilty. We're all going to pay the way. He says, no, they were not guiltier. We're all guilty. Two times he gave the same warning. Unless you repent, you turn from your wicked way. Unless you turn from yourself and turn to Christ. Listen, unless you repent, you too will likewise not just die, but perish. Perish. Now, that's the preface to the story. Now the parable, the story, the illustration. He then told them a parable, and the parable is about a man. That's your first blank in a whole series of them here. It's about a man. He doesn't designate the man, but those who are reading the passage often identify uh, the man as being the, 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 the God the Father figure. There is a man. He had a fig tree. The fig tree would have been like the nation Israel. Okay, And he planted his, his fig tree in a vineyard among all the nations of the earth. And, and then he went back and, and, to, and he looked for fruit on it. But there is no fruit. What's the fruit he's looking for? God was looking for repentance. A nation that would repent. John the Baptist had come as the forerunner declaring, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus comes along, he starts re preaching the same message. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? The king is present. Accept the king. So a man could be the nation. It could be any individual man. The fig tree could be anybody who's in this world, the vineyard. And, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. And so what he does, the vine dresser, some believe this, this represents Jesus. Okay, so the man, the father, goes to the man who took care of the vine, the, the vine dresser. He goes to him and he starts to ask. He says, I have certain expectations. For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. And some put that as a parallel to the three years of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. I've been looking for the nation to repent and receive Jesus Christ as Messiah. He says, but you know what? When I read the Old Testament, I find there's more to this. There's great expectation, but it says, listen, in the Old Testament it said, when you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, fig tree, regarded as fruit for, that is forbidden, for three years, you are, not to, you are to consider it as forbidden fruit. It must not be eaten. Okay? So you got the first three years. In the fourth year, the fruit will be holy, set apart, designated only to God, and offering of praise unto the Lord. So when, I, when you plant, this fig tree was planted, for four years, you can't partake of it. But the fourth year, it should be producing fruit. In the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit. So the fifth year is really the first year this man could eat of the fruit. So in the fifth year, he goes and there's nothing there. He goes in the sixth year, nothing there. He goes in the seventh year, nothing yet there. It is now the eighth year and he's finding there's no fruit on this fig tree. He's really patient. But his patience has come to an end. 
said, I've been coming three years now that I get to come. Seven years. And I haven't found any fruit. Here's the consequences. Cut it down. Cut it down. Fell the tree. Knock it down. Get rid of it. Why should it use up the soil? It's at this point, the vine dresser steps in. The man replied, it just needs more time. Isn't that what many of us say? I know I should be, but I'm going to procrastinate another week. We do this all the time. You know where we do it most? A diet. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to start that on Monday so I can eat all this food over the weekend, right? And Monday comes and something else pops up. Well, I'm going to start it on Tuesday. I just need more time. But people... I, I, People are saying, I'm eating more time before I repent and turn from my own ways and I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and I do it his way. I just need more time to wallow in my muck and mire of sin. So I just need more time. Sir, leave it alone because for one more year, he's wanting one more year so he can put more energy into it. Or just, if I had more time, I couldn't put more energy in it. I'll dig around it. Not only is he going to put more energy into it, he says, I'll just put more resources into it. I'll fertilize it. It's kind of like the, the preacher that just keeps preaching and preaching, preaching his heart out, and there's no response, no repentance, no turn, no change. And he says, I just need more time, a better message. I'm going to just preach harder. I'm going to do better. And he's wanting, he's wanting the change to take place, fruit in the lives of his people. Then he says, listen, it just need, really needs more time. If you give one more year, it bears fruit next year. He says, fine. We, we get to get the fruit off of it. Everything will be well. That's what the word really is, well, well. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been fruitful in a few things, now I put you over many things, many things. Okay, well. He says, but on the other hand, if it bears fruit, it's well. But on the other hand, he says, if not, this tree is to be felled. Cut it down. Cut it down. Cut it down. What's the point of the story? Jesus ends it right there. What's the point of the story? It's a cliffhanger. Jesus has left you hanging on the cliff waiting for what happens next. Listen, did the fig tree bear fruit? Did it change? Did, did everything turn around? Was it fruitful? Um, or on the other, did it remain barren? There was no fruit, no productivity, nothing from the tree. Listen, was it cut down? Story's over, folks. We're not told. We're not told what happened to the fig tree. You've got to ask yourself, why? Why the cliffhanger? Why does Jesus do this? I think it's to leave us asking ourselves, am I a barren fig tree? What fruit is in my life Am I just taking up space in time and location? Or is there actually something in my life that bears fruit to God and God sees it and says, whoa, wonderful, this is good fruit in this life? Has God's patience with me run out? <laughs> is it 11.59 and at 12 o'clock? Everything comes down. You see, he's left us clip hanging about our own lives. Should I be cut down? Do I need to repent and change my ways?
Here it is. This is the real question. Am I bearing fruit for God's glory? What is the fruit that God receives from my life? I want to tell you, I cannot answer that question for you. I can only answer that question for me. Only you can answer these questions. Is your life fruitful? Or do you need to repent? Because there's more than a bridge out ahead. It's more than I'm going to one day die as a consequence of some stupid thing I've done or action or accident or somebody else's gesture. It's a matter of eternity that's in the balance. Do I know Jesus and do I live for him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a sobering message that Jesus left them with. Cuts right to the chase. Why am I here? What is my purpose and am I fulfilling that purpose for you? Is there fruit in my life that glorifies you? Lord, I pray we would search our hearts. And in this moment, you would reveal to us that which we need to confess. And that which we need to change. So that we might be on the path that leads to eternal life. By living in faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior from our sins. And glorifying him. Bless us, O Lord, with the empowerment of the Spirit to truly repent and turn so we might hear of you. Well done. Good and faithful servant, you've been fruitful. You've been fruitful. Bless us this way we ask, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. The King above all kings. Hey. This is amazing grace. This is unending love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. for me. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross.
was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy. thoughts are this. The story doesn't have to be a cliffhanger for you. It's real simple. You repent and you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You turn from your own way. You turn to Jesus. You accept him. And you live for him. Your life produces fruit. Abundant fruit. Your life is very fruitful. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He's not going to withhold any good thing. In fact, the Bible says that. He'll not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. The time was running out. He had been patient for years. And God is patient with us. Let's not push the boundaries. Let's call on him today. As we bow our heads for prayer, If you've never received Christ and you want to receive him today, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to receive Christ. Just slip up your hand. I'll pray for you that you'll receive the Savior. Perhaps uh, you've wandered away. You have not been bearing fruit. You need the vine dresser to do a little work. And you say, you know what? I know Christ is my Savior, but your final prayer, Lord, uh, Pastor, pray for me to the Lord that as I return, that he'll produce fruit in my life. I'm returning today. Would you just slip your hand and say yes, pray for me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these words that came in, in a gracious tone where he said, no, they weren't the worst sinners of all on the earth but in a warning tone repent turn from your wicked ways Father we pray that a hand that was lifted saying yeah I'm coming back I need, I need you I need your power I need your fruitfulness in my life I will live for you bless O oh Lord that this will be a turning point this day And Lord, as a life is surrendered to you, it would bear more and more fruit for your glory. It would be a blessing to you, O God, and that you would bless them at the same time. Father, I pray in a few moments we'll be going to uh, our soup and a sandwich and then a a Bible study. I pray, Lord, for your blessing upon the, the meal that we have, the fellowship around the table, that your blessing would be upon us. In Christ's name. Amen.